Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Merci beaucoup pour l'invitation. Euh, malheureusement, je ne parle pas beaucoup français. So... English. Yeah, thanks a lot. I was delighted to hear that the bees on your island are Apis mellifera unicolor, which is an African subspecies. So we can discuss that later, but I was really relieved to hear that. All right, good. Today, my talk will be about small feet of spread and biology. And, you know, when you go back in time, when I met the small beetle for the very first time in, in, in South Africa, there were only five papers published on this pest. So even though my English was very poor, I was able to read it within a few weeks. And since then, you know, that has significantly changed. So when you check now, over 3,000 papers have been published on small beetle. So something must have changed compared to 1997. And indeed, things have changed. Um, we already seen the map, so the smaller beetle has really spread like considerably. Here in the in sub-Saharan Africa, in the dark area, you see the native distribution range. And then it started in 1996 in the United States. Then you know it moved over to Egypt, 2000, and we have a whole range of distributions, most recently, like in your case on La Réunion. So when you're seeing this picture, like you know, first of all. There is more damage to managed Western honeybees in the invasive ranges. So we have very clear evidence, you know, that smaller beetle is causing more of a problem in areas where honeybees of European origin or European honeybees are kept, for example, in Australia and the United States. In Africa, the smaller beetle is a pest and consider the beekeepers, they are aware of it, but it's nothing compared to what you have in the invasive ranges. So again, I'm quite happy that you have on your island the bees from Madagascar. That puts things a bit in perspective, I believe. All right, so the question is, how does the beetle manage to get there? Ah, oh, sorry, one question, I, I, one thing I, I uh, have not mentioned yet is, in, in China, you have Eastern honeybees, Apis serranid, and other parts of Asia. And we now have evidence that smaller beetle seems to damage those bees more than Apis mellifera. So when you look at the spread here, we should also be concerned not only about the honeybees we keep, but also about the wild bees and other species. All right, good. So one, one set of data, which I think Perkler is, is actually putting it nicely, is something I want to show here. As most invasive species, small beetle shows the so-called jump dispersal. So you have big jumps from the, from the endemic range to the new ranges. And then within the new ranges, the beetle can further spread. The, what we did is, you know, we checked here in one study, we looked at genetics. So we took beetle samples from Africa and beetle samples from the invasive ranges. We were even able to have the very last remaining larvae from the Portugal incident here in 2004, also able to check this one out. And we had some indications where the beetle could have come from. That is here in red. You can see the lines in red. Correlations are not causation, clearly. But so we had, do we have any independent source of data? Yes, indeed, there was because the Food and Agricultural Organization has really nice keeping track on the global trade with beeswax. And here you can see in yellow that this is actually nicely matching. The bees we have, the beetles we have in Italy, they have an, 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 an African origin and which exactly matches the history of wax import to Italy the years beforehand. Then the only major source of export from Africa is not honey, but it's wax. And the wax has been brought in the US. And then from the US, these pictures here match almost in all cases. The few exceptions, for example, the exception is here in, 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 in Portugal. But here, there was, we know for sure that this was imported via bees and not via wax. That has been confirmed. Good. So the combination of the genetics and the data, the trade data, strongly suggests that international trade of beeswax is a key for jumps of the species, when we want to understand how it goes really from A to B across continents. However, there is another mechanism for, for the widespread, which I touched already on. Package bees, queen cages, and colonies have also been confirmed in quite a number of cases. For example, again, here in Portugal, queen cages, and there was colony export into Egypt, and so on and so on. There are a whole number of things. So to sum that up in total, international trade with wax or bees governs the global spread of smaller beetle. There we have very good evidence on this. All right, now we're going further. When we are in the in, in new invasive ranges, 
There also the beetle can spread over there. And here are pictures from the United States. On the left-hand side, you can see the situation in 1998, where the states in, in the south are infested. And then two years later, the states in the north bordering Canada were infested with small life beetles, but there was a white spot in between. So there was no beetles in between those states. So since small life beetles cannot fly over hundreds or thousands of kilometers, there must be something else. And indeed, in the United States, we have professional migratory beekeeping over long distances. For example, beekeepers move their hive from Florida to do almond pollination in California. And then they go back from California, they do blueberry pollination in the north and so on. So small life beetle was as a blind passenger with migratory beekeepers. There's, I think, really clear evidence for this one. So migratory beekeeping is a major factor for the spread of small life beetle when it is in new ranges. Good, now gets gets to the life cycle of Etina tumina in association with a social bee host colony. And the red uh, arrows, you can see the major stages. That's the adult beetle, then we're having the eggs, the larvae and the pupae. So the smaller beetle is invading honeybee colonies. The bees have little chance <clears throat> in keeping them out. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the smaller beetle can infest uh, strong and weak colonies with equal impunity. That's known since Lundy, 1940. And within the colonies, the bees are also trying to keep the beetle away from the combs. So you, for example, in the corner, you can see that the bees try to encapsulate the beetle in with propolis, which is sometimes efficient, sometimes less efficient. Within a colony, you have a whole range of other behaviors. The border beetle may lay very few eggs only, what we call cryptic low-level reproduction. There, the beetle is, you can hardly see it as a beekeeper. You really go through a hive and you have to really look very careful to see occasional eggs, occasional larvae. What you do see as a beekeeper is very often, you see so-called destructive mass reproduction. You come to a hive, you already smell, something smells strange, like a foul smell. And you open the hive and there are thousands of maggots. This is mass reproduction. And the bees are usually leaving the colonies, they swarm to run away. And then, you know, the beetles have, the bees have a number of things that can attack, for example, intruding small life beetles. They can remove the eggs or either the larvae carry out of the colony. But the beetles have, you know, a number of really sophisticated strategies to, to survive. For example, here they can exploit the social feedings and back for food from the bees. And, you know, when the, the smaller beetle have finished their life cycle, they leave the hive to be paid in the soil. And in the soil, uh, the soil texture is key, but also the humidity and the temperature. So I'm afraid your warm climate is a perfect breeding ground for small hive beetles. So yeah, I'm very happy to go into more details here, but this is like a rough overview on the life cycle in association with a honeybee colony. What we can say is those beetles are omnivorous. They eat almost everything. They are very, very, so to say, yeah, opportunistic. And they can vive on, on various food sources within and outside of host nest. So they steal food from the bees. They can feed on live adult bees. I've seen like a, like a beetle attacking a forager bee from behind and trying to kill it. They can eat the brood, they eat honey pollen, but they also can be seen on flowers, visiting flowers, and they feed also on fruits. So it's very generous species. And the damage to colonies, I think which is important, is much more common in the invasive ranges. When I was working in Africa, I rarely saw this mass reproduction, very few times over all those years. And this distinct parasite impact is probably due to quantitative differences in infestation levels. If you have many beetles, you have more problems and host behaviors. So the Africanized bees are, for example, more aggressive towards smaller beetle and push it more often. And the infestation levels, for example, in Florida are much, much higher than I've ever seen in Africa. Climate can also play a role. If it's dry, the beetle has problems to, to reproduce because the pupae don't make it in the soil. And animal release can also play a role. Animal release means when the smaller beetle has left Africa, some of the enemies in Africa are left behind. So you don't have diseases or special parasites, which you have in Africa, but you do not have in, in the new ranges. However, we know very little for that in this regard. Good, alternative hosts and food sources, I touched on that already. We saw here as, as infestation of a 
of a stingless bee colony in, in Australia. I've seen that myself when I worked there in around 2000. That is common. They are quite often there, but doesn't seem to damage so massively the, these bees. Then also like uh, stingless bees, you know, are infected here in Brazil, a recent paper. They can also go to, um, to infest a nest of solitary bees. Here that is a mega shear rotundata nest in the United States. And you can see the beetle is intruding, laying eggs, and the larvae are feeding on whatever is in the nest. And this is something also like I only seen quite recently, a couple of years ago in the United States, smaller beetles are visiting flowers. And when they do so, they can at least you know, survive longer than they don't have access to flowers. So very obvious to you guys, the picture is quite complicated. We don't have one host and one parasite. No, in fact, we have many, many different sources where the beetle can do that. I'm not sure you should probably, sh you should have stingless bees in at La Réunion, but uh, sorry, I don't know that. In any case, there is an urgent need to better understand the role of alternative hosts and food sources to estimate the impact and to enhance our control efforts. Good. Then like a few like, you know, bonus points on the basic biology that might be of interest. Here you can see a small eyed beetle is, is feeding, um, um, is being fed by a worker. They have a very sophisticated strategy, much like a worker is doing with each other. They use the antenna and they drum apparently the right rhythm to convince the bee to feed them. And what we now know from a paper published two years ago, that the beetles are also receiving protein-rich food from the feeding glands of the bees. But we don't know whether that is sufficient that the beetles can activate the ovaries and start laying eggs. Important question we need to address. Another one is here. We looked at you know, the, the hydrocarbon profile, which is basically how they smell. And you know, these beetles, what we know already, they are readily attacked by the bees. The bees don't fool around, they bite them, try to sting them. And you know, that's pretty obvious, the smaller beetle is no, using no chemical disguise as other parasites do, but instead they rely on their hard exoskeleton and their defense behavior. For example, here in the right corner, you can see what we call the turtle defense posture. When a beetle is attacked by the bee, they just put their head underneath and they put the legs tied to the body that the bees really they almost, it's almost impossible for the bees to kill the beetle when it's in a defense posture like this. And also what we now have found very recently last year, that smaller beetles mating with really both female and male beetles mate many times. That has, you know, large consequences. First of all, a very small number of beetles is already sufficient probably to establish a viable population. So it's a big advantage for an invasive species when a female the females, uh, smaller beetles are having a spermatheca, that's a special organ where they store the sperm from all the mating males. So when they have that, you know, a few females are probably already sufficient to establish a viable population, for example, at La Réunion. There's an example, for example, from guppies, from fish, one mated female guppy is sufficient to establish a viable population in a new range. Good, all right. The basic biology here, to sum that up, is still very poorly understand, I'm afraid so. And this is mitigation as limiting our mitigation efforts, because only if we understand the smaller beetle better, we can have a better grip without harming the bees and the beekeepers, I believe. So we need to enhance our knowledge here. Good. I would like to summarize my presentation quickly. Smaller beetle is a widespread invasive species, with global bee and wax trade being key for jumps between ranges. Migratory beekeeping is fostering the spread in the new ranges. We have very clear evidence from the United States. They show an exceptional degree of parasite opportunism, going to stingless bees, going to flowers, feeding on fruits, whatever. The basic biology is still far too poorly understood. Again, we should enhance this here. Important for you guys, damage to colonies is more common in the invasive ranges, but you have African honeybees, Ipis mellifer unicolor. So the situation at La Réunion may be different compared to Australia or Europe. Urgent need to enhance our knowledge about this pest in any case. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Est-ce que les PCR, euh, parce que vous dites que les PCR euh, se déplacent grâce aux, aux échanges euh, internationaux, quoi, enfin, aux échanges commerciaux, aux échanges de cire, etc. Correct, que... international trade of wax and bees. Que euh, les... Cagettes de fruits importés peuvent, euh, 
peuvent euh, bah, contenir, enfin, être un moyen de transport du PCR. There is no evidence. We have now 24 confirmed cases of small beetle introductions globally. There was not one evidence that fruit cases were the reason. It is always impossible to show that something cannot happen, but we have no evidence for that. The overwhelming evidence is that it's wax import and B imports. This is very clear. So yes, we cannot exclude it, but it's extremely unlikely. Euh, donc, quels peuvent être les ennemis naturels du PCR Est-ce que les fourmis peuvent nuire à son développement um, ouf. Ah, Good question. Uh, we have studied a little bit on this in Africa, and you know, indeed, ants are attacking the larvae. So, when the larvae are leaving the colony to pupate in the ground. I've seen in South Africa that ants attack the larvae and grab them. However, the beetles are clever. They have two strategies. Strategy number one, they leave en masse. So when you have a colony and the beetle larvae, they seem to have like an internal clock. They go at once. So you have several dozens or hundreds of larvae leaving. So whenever the ants are there, they cannot catch everything, everyone. And also the larvae are often covered with a slime from the fermented honey, so that the ants don't like that. So this slime is protecting them. Another enemies are chicken. Chicken eats the larvae when they go out of the hive, but again, chicken, even if they're very hungry, they can eat hundreds at a time. We also know that there are fungi and nematodes attacking the beetles in the soil, but we know extremely little how often this is the case in Africa compared to the other ranges. So yes, we know a few enemies, but we don't know enough. En quoi les abeilles africaines seraient plus résistantes? Good question. <clears throat> In 2004, Paddy Elson and myself wrote um, that the, 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 the African bees are better able to cope with small life beetles because of quantitative difference in a range of behaviors. And whatever the African bees are doing against the beetle, we can see the same in European honeybees. So they're doing the encapsulation, they attack them. So <clears throat> it is not a um, black and white. So the African bees have something what the European bees don't have, but the African bees are just doing it better. And <clears throat> one, one particular reason I personally believe is important is, you know, the African bees are very mobile. That like your bees unicolor and probably on, on La Réunion. If the bees don't like it, they, they go. European honeybees are very much, my home is my castle. They stay in their hive forever, even if the beetles are almost taking it over. So when they run away from the beetle, sorry, they leave a lot of stuff behind. So I guess the, the chances for reproduction of the beetle are probably much higher in when, when they take over a colony of European honeybees compared to colonies of African honeybees. African honeybees do a better job. They run away and leave little food behind. So because of this, you have more beetles. And the more beetles you have, the higher you have the problem. So again, small differences between the European and Africanized honeybees and African honeybees. And this can explain the different impact. That is what we have. So I'll wrap up with us at the moment down. Et une question qui va un peu dans le même sens. Est-ce qu'on a observé euh, Est-ce qu'on a observé des colonies d'abeilles qui ont euh, développé la résistance au fur et à mesure Enfin, des colonies d'abeilles, du coup, qui étaient sensibles de base, donc des, des abeilles européennes, par exemple um, Maybe. <coughs> I, I don't, we don't know that. The problem is, in, at least in Australia and in the United States, we as beekeepers do everything to limit natural selection. We are breeding queens, we eliminate colonies which are too aggressive or don't produce a real honey. So by doing this, we prevent that the bees can naturally adapt to small hive beetle. There might be something in Australia because <clears throat> Australia had a large feral population of European honeybees thanks to the absence of a row destructor. So there might be, that is a good point. One should actually look into Australian feral bees as long as Varroa has not killed them yet whether those bees are better able to deal with small life beetle than the managed colonies, 
because the big keepers in Australia have a big problem. Talk to them and you can learn a lot of tricks. But again, Jeff will talk about this. But yes, adaptation of European honeybees to this pest is possible, but only if we beekeepers allow for that. Une question rapide, est-ce qu'on connaît le cycle du coléoptère Et après, je pense, je vais faire, prendre encore deux questions et après, on va arrêter les questions. Yes. Uh, we are familiar with the life cycle. We know how it's going, yeah. Uh, donc là, une question donc, qui dit que plus une, une colonie est populeuse, plus elle aura de miel et de cire, donc plus elle va attirer le petit coléoptère. Mais dans le même temps, elle sera moins sensible vu qu'elle sera populeuse. Et euh, pourtant, c'est les colonies faibles qui vont en souffrir. No, unfortunately not. And um, well, <coughs> weak colonies seem to be more susceptible. We have some indication for this. This is also possible as a reason why queenless colonies are more more susceptible because you have a decline in the workforce over time. And we believe that the the number of bees per square centimeter nest that makes a difference. If the bees are able to keep the combs in check, the bees have no possibility to penetrate. So if there is a big, den the density of bees to comb, that I think is a key to understand. And, but this does not necessarily mean that the colonies are doing well. I've personally seen really strong hives in Australia, 10 frames of bees, Paul, a solid colony was killed after two weeks. So, Again, there we don't know why this mass reproduction is triggered. We don't really know the keys doing that. And but as a rule of thumb, a stronger colony is usually better able to cope with smaller beetles. Yeah. Du coup, là, c'est vraiment les deux dernières questions. Donc, la nymphose du PCR peut être plus longue en cas de sécheresse okay. ou de froid. We shouldn't let Dr. Pettis wait for too long. Yeah. <laughs> oui, il faut peut-être. Euh, oui. Bon. Yeah, enfin, du coup, la nymphose du PCR peut être plus longue en cas de sécheresse ou de froid. Et la personne précise qu'elle pense aux résistances lors d'échanges commerciaux. Small life beetle can survive for a long time without any food and water, or with a little bit of water. They can survive for several months. Interestingly enough, uh, beetles from Africa are better able to survive starvation than beetles from United States. So, but they made it in the first place. So, I assume. When you have wax, it depends also like how the wax is ex exported. If you have crude wax, like sometimes I sort of people put just whatever wax together, they see maybe traces of honey and things like that left. So that may facilitate their spread, but they can survive for quite some time without any food. They're able to starve for a long time, yeah. At least long enough that a ship can make it from, from Africa to another place, yeah. Okay, there were two questions, the last one or no? Uh, donc oui, une, une dernière, c'est ça. Dernière question, dans ce cas, pourrait-on faire de la reproduction euh, sélectionnée avec euh, les abeilles résistantes, donc toujours dans le cas des, des résistances euh, comportementales? Um, you mean, could we select bees for their resistance against small hive beetle? Because that's a question, because you know you can select bees for reproduction. Uh, for, for production. Um, Good question. Maybe. I don't know. There, because um, we, we, we still don't really know which traits of the bees are, are the key to, key to cope with small life beetle. And assuming that this <coughs> column mobility is one important factor for triggering the buildup of beetles. Again, African bees professional, when they go, they leave very little food behind. European bees leave lots of food behind when they go. So maybe we don't want that. There might be a trade-off. The traits which make bees more resistant to the small life beetle may make it less attractive for the beekeepers. So, but again, I don't know Apis millifera unicolor on La Réunion. Your bees may be able, much better able to cope with small life beetle than the bees in Australia and US. Future will tell, probably. Good, merci beaucoup pour, pour les questions.